thank you to my studio audience. Um, in studio with me today is a wonderful woman, Sophina Brown, producer of August Wilson's masterpiece, or one of them, Two Trains Running, currently playing at the Matrix Theater in Los Angeles. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I have to tell you, I saw this play on Saturday night. I still can't sleep. It's an incredible play. So well done. Beautifully executed. I love the actors, the characters, everything about it. Why don't you tell the studio audience um, about Two Trains Running, for those who just aren't familiar with it. Okay. Uh, Two Trains Running is a piece which is set in 1969. Uh, and so... it has the backdrop of everything that's happening with the civil rights movement, with the black power movement. Um, it's the seventh in the American Century Cycle written by August Wilson, and he has a play for each decade uh, mm. of the 20th century through American history. And this particular piece uh, is deep and thought provoking, but it's also extremely funny. Extremely funny. It, it, it takes place in 1969, Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And the lead character owns a diner. And he faces being tossed out by the development that's going on in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And each and every character from the waitress, I loved her, mm. um, to Hambone, I'm not going to give anything away, to the elderly gentleman who was the grandson of slaves, yes. um, has a story. And I fell in love with each one of these characters, I have to tell you, by the end of the play. Because you told the story, or he told the story, August Wilson, very richly of each one of these characters. Mm -hmm. They all pretty much had a lead, didn't they? Absolutely. It's yeah. an ensemble piece. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and this cast works together Oof. wonderfully as a unit. And they represent uh, the community at that time and how there there's struggle, there's pain, but there's also a lot of love. And a lot of resilience. Yes, People who want to keep word. going, they don't want to go back by any means. And you're right, they're stuck right within the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy trying to do his best to make a living. And, you know, a little bit of society wants to hold him back and the rest of him wants to move forward. Yeah, um, yeah. it's the whole... Uh, situation with urban renewal at that time and how there was so much destruction and so much tearing down, not just tearing down of buildings, but also tearing down of people. Um, and it's about how these particular men and women are overcoming mm -hmm. in spite of that. You know, I studied art history in school and I'm a firm believer that history somehow always manages to repeat itself. Mm. Um, we are now at 2019 and in a way we can go back to 1969 and say we can't have some of this stuff repeating yeah. in 2019 where do you draw some similarities well one of the uh, most I guess important and kind of a visceral reality for me and the reason behind why I wanted to do this play at this time is because of the similarity that we're seeing in today's society with people feeling marginalized and undervalued and not seen. Um, there is a character, uh, Risa, the waitress, who has actually scarred herself um, as a way for people to see her besides something other than her sexuality. And there's this common theme of all of these characters crying out in certain ways to be seen, to be valued. And I think that everyone now can identify with that. Our, our country is Most very, of us. Mo yeah, our country is very, it's very, a very divisive time. Um, and I think if you boil everything down, all of the arguments that are being made, all of the positions, all of the disagreements, people want to be seen and they want to be heard. For some reason, we seem to be at a time where you have the far right and the far left and not much coming together in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I always, I, we were talking on the phone, and I actually yeah. think a lot of that is the issue. People have their own agenda and really have no interest in seeing the other side. And that's what was going on in 69 and hence to history repeating itself. But we can't let it. Yeah. We can't let it. You know, mm -hmm. we live here. We're supposed to be living in a democracy and people have to hear each other. Absolutely. So that's why when I saw this play, 
um, it just very much to me mimicked what's going on now mm -hmm. and why it's so important. And it's Black History Month, but not just for black history, but the history of all people who felt oppressed. Yeah, this is America's history. And yes, that's right, still, it's America's history. Yeah, we're still dealing with so many issues of race because of just how this country was founded, just the very, you know. What do you say to people who say, oh, that happened then, it's not going on anymore, and I'm, boy, I could get into it with people when they tell me that? Well, um, I think that, you know, we would be naive to think mm -hmm. that this racism, um, it might not be overt, but it's systemic, oh, and yeah. it is in the very fabric of this country, whether we're talking about the educational system, housing, whether we're talking about employment, whether all, it is systemic and it, it seeps through every single aspect of day-to-day -day life for black Americans, for people of color. I mean, it is, it's who we are and we can't shy away from the hard conversations. Yeah. And none of us should, yeah. because everyone has an opportunity to see it, at least I feel that way, that we try to live with each other. That's what we were supposed to have been founded on. So yeah. we're all here now, the women, the blacks, the Muslims, everybody. So we, we've got to figure out a way to come together. Yeah. I, I have faith that it's going to happen. I do too. But how smart of August Wilson to present this play. Again, um, there's 10 of them that he wrote, mm -hmm. as you said. Um, one of his most famous is Fences, right? Yes. Um, with Denzel Washington and Viola Davis. Most recently, yeah. Most recent. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, but how smart of him to inject humor into this particular play because you, it leaves you there not, you're not getting hit over the head. You're leaving there thinking, hmm, so this is what was going on there. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And that's what August Wilson was so yeah. brilliant at was showing the humanity and showing uh, people at their most human, their most vulnerable, um, showing the pain. Because the thing is, is even though this is specific yeah. to um, uh, the black experience and even August Wilson's experience, like he knows these people that he wrote about and this, this community grew up in the Hill District. Um, and even though there is such specificity because of how powerful and gifted of a writer that he is. Incredible. He and has may made I, it universal. May I say he quit high school because he was mm -hmm. accused of plagiarism. <laughs> That's right. Good one. <laughs> yep. And then he goes on to write these masterpieces. Incredibly prolific probably thinking, you couldn't have possibly written this young man. Mm -hmm. And he's like, really? Okay, I'm out of here. Yeah. And look what he goes on to do, That's right? Because right. he knew his value and he knew his worth. And yeah. he wasn't letting someone else define him. Yeah, remember yeah. that. It's so true. Instead of going out to prove something, he's like, I'm gone. I'm just going to go do what I have to do. That's really right. brilliant and powerful move on his yeah. part. So let's talk a little bit about you. You're okay. a well-known actress. You're not just a producer, which is huge unto itself. Mm -hmm. But in case you're wondering where you've seen her, um, NCIS, Good Wife, Castle, Bones, series regular on Shark. Mm -hmm. So you're from Michigan. Mm -hmm. How'd you find it coming out here in Hollywood and making your mark? Oh, you know, I went to New York first. Uh. And uh, I really had no intention of coming out to Los Angeles because mm -hmm. I was so... Um, I love the hustle and bustle of New I York. I do too. However, when I got out here <clears throat> and I started working, I was like, this weather is not bad. You know what I mean? I was like, this weather is so uh, luring. Especially since you're from Michigan. Exactly. Then you go to New York, which is milder than Michigan. It is, but it's a different kind of, it's the experience of the cold in New York is different than Michigan, because Michigan, you're going from car to building, building to car. New York, you are in the elements, so. Because, you, you know, I'm from back east, and yeah. I love New York in the winter, because it's all of a sudden snow or rain, and then you yeah. jump into a building, and everybody's just talking about it, and then you walk out in two blocks, and you go somewhere else, and everybody's talking about it. You're right, there's this energy there is. pounding that pavement. But it's see, really cool. The problem, Deborah, is I was broke in New York, <laughs> and that is like a whole other kind of experience for, yeah. you know. But I um, came out to L.A. and just fell in love. Hmm. And then, you know. Then work happened. What was your first break out here? Oh, gosh. Out here, um, I did a bunch of pilots that didn't oh. get picked up initially. And then Shark was actually the first pilot that I did 
that got picked up for series. Um, and then when that was done, uh, it jumped right over to numbers as a series regular. Um, and so it was just kind of back to back to back to back to back. But pilots were really my bread and butter there for, for a long while. That's good to know. I didn't quite realize that, that you could almost make a, a living, you know, just doing those pilots oh, because, yeah, yeah, yeah you always absolutely. think about them getting picked up. But the pilots, um, yeah. wow. Yeah. So, and theater obviously must be a love of yours because this is no easy task to produce this play, right? No, no, but it is definitely worth it. It's a, it's a great challenge. It's a labor of love. I, theater is my favorite medium, yeah. uh, definitely. And when you find a canon like this and a writer like this, um, you want to be able to not only give yourself the opportunity to tell these stories, but to give other people the opportunity as well. And so assembling a cast and just from you know point A to Z, I love the entire experience because every single person who participates, every single person that you bring on board, whether it's cast, whether it's designers, director, whoever, um, they leave changed by August Wilson's work. They come in one way and they leave changed and transformed. I know you wanna do some of his other plays. Um, mm -hmm. It's tough to get to the rights to, to these, isn't it? Yes, it is, especially because uh, LA is a more visible market mm -hmm. um, and we have a little bit more competition in terms of uh, they don't really like you know things going up in LA if they're pending for Broadway if they're pending for New York um, and also the movies come into play with HBO and so it it is a little trickier to get the rights how'd you do it I'm then faithful how'd you do it what That's what big. was incredible and what was the biggest blessing in terms of the first one that I produced King Hedley the second um, was the first one I produced two two years ago in 2017 and it just happened to be at the time that uh, Denzel Washington and Viola Davis had done Fences and it was up for all wow. these Oscars, these Academy Awards and the Academy Awards were happening at the same time as my production of King Hedley II. So Constanza Romero, who is August Wilson's wife, uh, was in town for uh, uh, the Oscars. She was attending the Oscars. So the same weekend, she got to come and see King Hedley II, and she loved what we did. And she's friends with Michelle Shea, the director. And so when I put in rights this next time, she personally granted us the permission to do two trains running. I'm so pleased to hear that she did that. Yeah. Um, she recognized your work. I think it's great to have gone to a female producer and director. Um, I think that's just fantastic. So yeah. would you reach out to her again for the rights to the others? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I just definitely want to keep uh, that relationship and that dialogue going. And, you know, whatever title is available, that's how I'll... You'll uh, take it. I'll take it. You'll yeah. take it. Can, now, even though Denzel got the rights to Fences, mm -hmm. can you do it as well as a play? Or, or do you have to go to him? Like, how does that work? I honestly don't know. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Well, and, and it's, it's just timing of everything um, and working out. Now, because he did Fences so recently, and that's in people's recent memory, I'm going to wait a little bit. You're going to wait. Yeah. yeah. Um, to reach out about getting the rights to that one. But, um, but yeah, it's all timing, to all timing and permission. Hmm. What's your favorite moment from this play? I don't want to give too much away. I really want to impress upon people to please go see this. It's because it's not just um, a deep story, but it really is very, very funny. And the actors, mm. are, they're killing me. They're incredible. Yeah. It's an incredible, an incredible group. Um, and the interpretations have been magical to witness. Um, I would say that one of my favorite moments mm. of this play is, uh, it's a scene in act two. Um, we call it the jukebox scene. Uh, you might remember it's when uh, I call him the gambler because I know I never remember people's names. Was he sitting by the jukebox? No, it's it's when the jukebox plays for the first time finally. And, uh, Refresh me. There's a moment between Sterling and Risa where they dance. Oh. And uh, yeah, and you know, you want to talk about being seen. Like they see each other. That fully and was completely. 
beautiful. Yeah, yeah. That was just so touching and beautiful. Mm-hmm. She was a beautiful actress. She's I have to say. stunning. I honestly, I, I was just talking to Please my associate. Please tell her. Yeah. Oh, he's incredible. But I was just talking to my associate producer um, two days ago, and I was saying, I... The light bouncing off of Nyjah's face yep. is a play in and of itself. I'm Her telling you. Her face is just stunningly beautiful. She plays the waitress. And the, the way she plays the owner of the diner, who's also a good man. Mm-hmm. You know, and he mm-hmm. is a good man. But just the little looks that she'll give him. And she's almost anticipating the way he's going to be talking to her. <laughs> yeah. And sh- the way she can brush him off with a look. Incredible. Actress. There's a lot of history there. Yeah, there's a lot there's a of lot of history. history. They know each <laughs> they other. They know each other very well. There's a shorthand for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Very funny. But um, but yeah, this whole cast, Dorian and Monte. I mean, the, the whole cast. Uh, I I just I couldn't ask for anything more. I was a little surprised. I had some people say to me, August Wilson. I'm thinking, oh, they didn't know. So what could you tell people out there about August Wilson, his life? And what motivated him to write these 10 plays? Mm. I think what motivated him in part Mm. was the fact that, um, you know, we have a very specific history, um, the African-American history and the African-American experience oftentimes gets diminished, um, oftentimes gets overlooked or just completely omitted in a lot of um, worlds, whether it's ac- the academic world or the theatrical world. And he has given us this canon of plays which uh, gives value and not only um, value, but it, it he has taken the way that we interact with one another, um, our community, our experiences, and he has made extraordinary out of the ordinary. Um, he, and, and anyone can relate to it. Every, anyone, everyone. Not just an African-American That's community. Right. It's, it's really all of us. I really related to all of those characters. Absolutely. You feel um, like you know them. You grew up with them. You feel like you've seen them um, in your own families. But I think in part, you know, he saw that there was definitely uh, something missing uh, in the representation of black people in the theater, Mm -hmm. you know? And so he stood up and and, uh, he answered the call. He also did not live a long life, unfortunately. He was born, what, 1945, and he died in 2005 of liver cancer, quickly. So, but he left so much behind for all of us, a very, very rich history that plays so well today. I mean, yeah, look, Fences ended up as a major motion picture and Mm -hmm. so much more. If you had to do one next, which one would it be of his plays? I would love to do Seven Guitars next. What's it's that about? It's the uh, 1940s play, mm-hmm. uh, and it follows a uh, a guitar player, a musician, who um, is trying to get to Chicago uh, to live the life of, of a musician. He, he wants to, you know... The, do his jazz do, and his music exactly. and his, his guitar. Um, and he's, he, he comes back to get his girl to take to Chicago with him. Um, and a series of events happen. But I would really love to do Seven Guitars because it's actually a prequel to King Hadley II, which we've already done. Um, and also because that's the role that Michelle Shea, who I love to work with as director... That's the role that Louise is, is what she originated on Broadway and was Tony nominated for oh. and was in the room with Lloyd Richards and with August Wilson um, developing this character and hearing all of the conversations that took place in the early stages of this piece and to have her direct that here in Los Angeles, I think it, it would it's something that just, it gives me goosebumps. What are your thoughts on what's going on with theater in LA now? I oh, think it's as rich as can be. It's incredible. It excites me. Oh, me too. So um, I, I, I have seen some of the most exquisite you. things in Los Angeles. I go, to, I go to theater probably too much. My husband would tell you, like, you're going I out do too. again. If he yeah. doesn't want to go with you, I'll go with you. And you I am very serious. Just text Deborah, you want to go? Yeah. Uh, my husband loves going because, you know, we used to go all the time in New York. We had no money, and we would just find those half-price, quarter-price tickets. We would yeah. just go to anything. But I'll go because I think the, the, 
the theater community, especially the small theater community, is mm-hmm. very rich out here, it right? It really is. And I'm I'm so thrilled and excited yeah. to see what's coming down the pike in 2019. I mean, there's our, you told me about Paradise. Like, I really want to try and make it to, out to see that this weekend. And that's one produced by Viola Davis. That yeah. was one of my true favorites. We had the writer of Paradise on here as well. Um, yeah. And that's another one that keeps going on in my head and yours. And I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm losing sleep over these plays, <laughs> but um, for good reason. Yeah. So what's next for you? I mean, because you're also an actress. So yeah. um, I, it's so funny. We talked about pilots. I'm actually waiting to hear about a pilot that I shot. So hopefully um, that will be, you know, the next big thing. But uh, I was what is with, it? Can you tell me? Oh, uh, yeah. It was a it's a comedy pilot for TBS. Um, Lena Waithe's new pilot. She oh. was the uh, first uh, black woman to win an Emmy for com- comedy writing for mm-hmm. Master of None. Um, and it was just a thrill. To, oh, to that's work with great. Her. And so waiting to hear about that. So much great stuff going on now in TV as well. You don't just have to wait for one of the networks to call. You know, there's oh, yeah. so much else going on, right? Don't you feel like there's a, a, a richer array of, of things to choose from, right? Oh, absolutely. With Netflix and with Hulu, with all the original um, uh, series on these uh, cable networks, yeah. and it's the golden, the golden age of television. Do you have a favorite right now that you're watching? Oh, my goodness. Well, I have to say, shout out Mm. to the Golden Girls reruns always. That's always on high rotation. You can never go wrong with a Golden Girls (laughs) rerun. Never. But, no, um, apart from that, um, I I really enjoy comedies. So I've been watching uh, Friends from College on Netflix. Ah. And uh, even even some of the network comedies, like Single Parents, you know, has it. Oh, i got to pick that up. I'm going to try. It's really You want to know mine? (laughs) Mrs. Maisel. Oh, yeah. I'd kill to be in or on Mrs. Maisel, even in the background. I'll just sit in the audience. I love that. Have you seen it yet? I haven't seen it. Oh, please. It's so funny. I can't get over myself. But also the Kaminsky Method. That oh yes, my husband loves that one. Yeah. So that's another good. One. This is so much great stuff going on. Really uh, anything else you want to add about this tremendous play that I saw? Two trains running. Um, that you'd like to share? I just, just that I, I hope people know that even though this, the themes of this play um, are intense and they're 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 um, huge and vast uh, in terms of you know race and the history of this country. It's really funny. It's really, really funny. Look, and it's a, it just flies by, you know? Well, look, it takes place in a diner. Just sitting there waiting for the play to start, we were saying, wow, what a great set. I mean, just John Iacovelli, incre- genius. Right? He's a genius. It's, I felt like I was sitting in a, look, it felt like a diner at a New Jersey, Pittsburgh, whatever. And I've been to that diner before. In other mm. words, very comfortable. So just right there as you're sitting there, it looks like sort of a, a fun thing thing is yeah, about to happen yeah. and then it opens up and it's it's it, it actually is humorous even you can you can feel the undertone of what's serious but but it's funny yeah it's like all of that struggle and strife is taking place outside of the restaurant but when you get inside the yes. restaurant it's all love and laughs kind of like cheers everybody had an issue yeah. and they came into the bar and they were just funny yep you know, and yeah. they they bounced off of each other. Yeah. So that's actually a very good way to put it. Mm-hmm. They came into the diner, and then they sort of left what was going on outside. Outside. Yeah. So please, everybody, go see Two Trains Running. You did a marvelous job. Bravo Thank to you. Thank you. Um, at the Matrix Theater in Los Angeles. How, how long does it run for? We run in, uh, through March 3rd. Sunday, oh. March 3rd is our last performance. And it plays, what, Thursday, Friday? Thursday, Friday, Saturday at 8 p.m., and then Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. Oh, so there's quite a, quite a few performances. Oh, you have, yeah, you have. Uh, yeah. It's also a great area, the Matrix Theater. It's on Melrose if you're in L.A. and mm-hmm. kind of close to the Grove. It's just a great place to go. It's yeah. very central. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much thank for coming you. here, telling your story, telling August Wilson's story and Two Trains Running. I loved it. Please go see it. And uh, thank you so much for being here for Deborah Cobelt Live. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube and anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Apple Podcasts, uh, iHeartRadio, we're sort of everywhere. So uh, thanks to our fans for keeping us um, out there and popular. So we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.